Okay. Right, so the webinar is currently started, right. Well, by my watch, it's a quarter past one, and I'd like to welcome everybody who has registered for today's webinar with Dr. Nicola Ralph, Professor Nicola Ralph, and Sarah Kyo um, of the Celiac Society today. Thank you very much to everybody who has taken the time out of their lunchtime to tune in and listen up. So let me uh, begin by introducing myself. My name is Jill Brennan. I am currently the Chief Executive Officer of Celiac Society of Ireland, and I am very grateful to have so many people tuned in to us our talk today. Professor Nicola Ralph is our consultant dermatologist on the specialist register for dermatology in Ireland. She's an interest in inflammatory dermatology, uh, photodermatology, pregnancy related dermatosis and skin cancer, including dermatological surgery. We are delighted to have such a uh, a, a, a widely ranging dermatologist with us today uh, for our talk um, on uh, skin diseases and celiac disease in conjunction with our own in-house dietitian Sarah Kyo who is the founder of Eat Well Dietetics and has over 20 years experience working in nutrition and dietetics. Sarah has been with the Celiac Society now since 2018 and she has been using her expertise to guide a phenomenal number of our members through their day-to-day -day journey uh, uh, with a gluten-free uh, living life um, and and included in that are those of our members who are currently suffering from dermatitis herpetiformis, um, which comes along with celiac disease. Now, before I actually made the session live, I was having a very interesting conversation with Nicola and Sarah about DH and how once it appears um, uh, 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 in conjunction with celiac disease, how easy it is to actually get it under control. So Nicola, without further ado, I think mm -hmm. I'm going to call you in now and get you to um, tell us a bit more about this very, very itchy skin condition that um, arrives with celiac disease and some other kind of skin conditions that we may not necessarily be aware of either. Great, great. Thanks, I'm sorry to share my screen. Um, so we'll just bring it up here and nice. So thank you for having me. I hope everyone can uh, see that full screen there. So um, today I'm going to focus on dermatitis herpetiformis and it's obviously a close relation with celiac disease, but we will do a bit of a whistle stop tour through some other skin conditions. And I know we only have a short period of time. Each of these skin conditions could probably take an hour to discuss by themselves, but we, we'll make a start at it and interrupt me if I'm uh, blabbering on too much. So um, dermatitis herpetiformis would be the one definitely linked with celiac disease, but it only has an instance of about one in 10,000. Um, so it isn't obviously the commonest skin condition that I would see. Um, dry skin can be associated with CDF disease. So patients just reporting that they feel their skin is flaking off more easily or it's a bit itchy. You can also develop angular colitis, which is where you get dryness at the angles of the mouth and sometimes cracking in the angles of the mouth. Also aphthous ulceration or essentially mouth ulcers. So um, in approximately 20% of, of those who suffer with celiac disease would present uh, with regular occurrences of mouth ulcers. Psoriasis can be associated, but there's very little research um, as a definite link. Uh, but we do know that on the autoimmune spectrum, patients who suffer with one autoimmune disease can suffer with another one more frequently. Acne can be seen, and it's not directly caused by celiac disease, but if there's any hormonal imbalance, this will affect uh, the skin and the gut, essentially. So that's why we can see it sometimes more frequently. And again, rosacea is on the same genetic spectrum as type 1 diabetes, mellitus, and celiac disease. So again, some patients will suffer with rosacea more frequently. So what it is, um, is that 
I'm going to just say DH from now on, otherwise I'll get uh, tongue twisted by the end of it. But DH and celiac disease are due to an intolerance uh, of gliadin fraction of gluten found in wheat, rye and barley. And this gluten triggers production of IgA antibodies and essentially an autoimmune process that's targeting your skin and your gut. So you will get inflammation of the gut, which may result in diarrhea, fatigue, weight loss, abdominal cramps. But the majority of patients with DH, over 90% of them, will also have um, gluten sensitive enteropathy with symptoms, but their symptoms may not be very, very severe and some patients can actually remain symptom free. So interestingly enough, DH is slightly more common in men, whereas in celiac disease, it's slightly more common in females, just like most other autoimmune conditions are slightly more common in females. And the commonest age for it to present is about 15 to 40, but it can present in childhood, but that's actually quite rare. But if patients do have DH, they tend to have more severe intestinal pathology in comparison to those without DH. So what you're looking for, and for anyone listening in today, is that you would have a very, very itchy rash. When I say very itchy, it really takes over your life. There's very few things in the skin that are this itchy, uh, apart from scabies, which can be this level of itch, where you're literally scratching to the point where you're tearing your skin. It tends to have a symmetrical distribution on the back of the scalp, the neck, the shoulders, the buttocks, the elbows and the knees. So it's pretty much a mirror image on both sides of the body. They're very, very itchy spots. Some of them will have a pink base, which you can see from the photo here. And classically, you'll see these little vesicles, which are these tiny little fluid filled blisters. But for some people, by the time you see them, all they have left are these scratch marks because they literally burst the blisters within seconds because they're that itchy. They can occur in little groups or clusters, uh, but the top of them is often eroded. And what that means is the top layer of the skin is broken. But thankfully, you won't scar with it if you don't dig deep enough. So you can always replace the top layer of your skin. And for some patients, they can just present as little tiny little pinpoint bleeding at the tips of their fingers, but that would be deemed more rare. This is much more classic DH. It can be confused with scabies because it's so itchy and scabies presents as little spots too. And it can be confused with the papular or little spot type of dermatitis. And then when the lesions are clearing up, they tend to resolve with a lot of staining of the skin and it may take months and months for that staining to fade. The other conditions, as I said, associated with uh, celiac disease would be classically here, these aptus ulcers that you would see, Angu angular colitis where patients get splitting at the angle of the mouth here, but that can also be due to B12 deficiency. And if you're having a problem with absorption of your food, you may also have a low B12 and may need to take replacement. Uh, dry skin can also be common, and I'll go through that in, in a minute. Some patients will have thin enamel. Um, obviously, more rarely, if they're not absorbing vital vitamins, you can have a taxi or loss of your balance. And this is particularly important in those with low B12. Uh, and more rarely, heart conditions, recurrent miscarriages, fatty liver, which can result in abnormal liver function. And also more rarely, for patients who don't stick strictly to a gluten-free diet, they are at a rarer, longer term complication of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the gut. So it is important um, to stick to your gluten-free diet, not only for the skin, but of course for the bowel. So how we diagnose it really is a clinical diagnosis. So obviously I would see somebody with uh, images like um, I've just shown you already, but then I would prove it with a skin biopsy. And really it's a minor procedure under a tiny bit of local anesthetic where we take two tiny uh, biopsies of skin, just three millimeters in diameter and then we send it off to the laboratory for analysis so one goes to the regular laboratory and one goes for special tests called immunofluorescence and really what you're seeing is this pattern light up under the uh, special microscope and this is classic of dermatitis herpetiforis or IgA deposition along here. We will also do blood tests to outrule any nutritional deficiencies uh, including checking for other autoimmune conditions such as thyroid dysfunction uh, and making sure the patient is absorbing these other vitamins and we can do very specific HLA um, for human leukocyte antigen testing, but really these are not necessary all of the time. You basically make the diagnosis up here with these tests. So obviously any patient who's diagnosed with DH uh, is recommended to have a gluten-free diet. So this require, reduces the patient's requirement to actually use medication to control their, their itchy rash. It also improves their, their gut symptoms. It enhances their nutrition and their bone density. And of course, it may reduce the risk of developing other autoimmune conditions and intestinal lymphoma, which again is quite rare. So if we do have to use medications, obviously we can't put people straight on medication without checking their blood. So there's a little bit of a delay in getting the biopsy results and the blood test results. So we would use ultra potent topical steroids, so the strongest steroids on the market 
to put onto the itchy rash to ensure the person gets temporary relief. If they're really, really bad and debilitated by the itch, I will use oral steroids, but rarely do I have to do that, um, to be honest. Uh, and then I would start them on Dapso. Uh, so it's a very low dose that we start off and we work our way up until the patient is asymptomatic. So the rash is clearing and the itch is gone. And thankfully it's a very fast acting drug. So patients would have significant improvement by day three that they really feel the itch is under control. And um, there are some pre-screening bloods which are very important. We do check a special enzyme called glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Uh, now, rarely is that an issue in Irish patients, but in the Mediterranean population, they tend to have a deficiency in this enzyme. And if they cannot, um, if they do not have this enzyme, then they cannot process dapsone and it would be very dangerous to give them that drug. So it is important that the person will be screened for this and to know that they have a basic full blood count that's normal and a special blood test called reticulocyte counts that we keep an eye on if you go on dapsone. So the treatment tends to last for month to years and you have to still maintain your gluten-free diet. And for some patients, they're symptom-free for so long that I start to reduce the dose and I keep reducing the dose until they tell me that their itch is starting to come back or the rash is starting to come back. And then we know that's the dose that works for them. But over time, you can reduce it further when you've been on your gluten-free diet for some, for some length of time. And for some of my patients, they actually only take it once a week just to keep their symptoms at bay. So it can be very infrequent that you have to take it. We do have to do regular blood monitoring. So it's every month for the first three months to make sure your full blood count is stable. And then roughly three times a year after that. But one of the rare side effects is a hemolytic anemia. And really what this means is, as you can see from this image, that you're getting destruction of your red blood cells. So the patient, if they're taking Dapsin, would describe that they feel fatigued, short of breath. They may notice that their lips are a little bit blue or the tips of their fingernails and um, their fingers are turning blue. So obviously when you're counseling someone to give them this drug, you tell them to watch out for these signs. And if they notice it, then they would just come off the drug. So moving on to dry skin, and sorry for the, the rush through it all, but there's a lot to get through. And um, the other term we use is xerosis. And obviously anyone who has dry skin, this can cause them to be itchy. And then this unfortunately leads to the itch scratch cycle where you're basically itching and scratching. And then this causes the release of inflammatory chemicals. Then that causes pain, redness and swelling of your skin. This then stimulates your nerve endings to cause more itch. And then you start scratching again and it's a vicious cycle. So to try and break this cycle, because we don't want you to take off the top layer of the skin from scratching and put you at increased risk of infection, we would suggest that you take emollient showers, that you keep it short and limit it to less than five to 10 minutes. The temperature is only lukewarm, not hot water, because that'll remove your own natural oils. To only use emollient showers, so gentle products, soap-free, SLS-free, paraben-free, so no soaps or bubbles, and to pat your skin dry rather than rub it. And within two minutes of um, essentially towel drying the skin, try and put on your emollient immediately to this slightly damp skin as there's better absorption that way. So always avoiding soaps and bubbles and excessively fragrance products. And if you're very, very dry, um, you can use moisturizer which have urea in it. So urea is good for people who are really, really uh, excessively dry. And this can run in some families where some people just ha have significantly dry skin. So moving on to rosacea, because it's so common in Ireland and there is a link with patients with celiac disease that it affects one in 10 Irish adults, roughly in your middle age from your 30s to your 60s. And there are multiple different types. So the classical type that you would most commonly see would be the papular pustular, which is your small red spots and your yellow heads, classically on your cheeks, your nose and your chin. Erythematotelangiectatic, which is the red broken capillaries, which patients tend to flush if they get hot or if they drink alcohol or eat spicy food. Phimosis type, which is when you get a more bulbous nose where the skin is thickening up on the nose, which is much more common in men than women. It's actually very rare in women. And then there's ocular subtype where patients just describe dry or itchy eyes. And then a more recent onset diagnosis of neurogenic rosacea, which is patients who just flush, but they don't always have the background broken capillaries that are persistent, but they just flush easily. And they tend never to get the inflammatory spots, but they tend to have very fair, typical Irish skin, very, very pale, fine skin on the face. So the causes are multifactorial. Initially, there may be erythema or redness, which is uh, essentially the start of an inflammatory continuum, but it can be initiated by in part your immune response and also in, in part due to your blood vessels and your nerve, your nerve uh, fibers as well. You get an increase in mast cells, which are cells within the skin and in the blood. And then basically you get damage and your blood vessels become leaky. And then you get these fixed broken capillaries on the nose, cheeks and chin. It's ultimately due to UV damage. So you do need to use a broad spectrum sunscreen regularly. And then there's a, this 
Demodex folliculorum, which is a harmless mite that lives on everyone's skin, but it's been found in higher numbers in those who suffer with rosacea compared to the general population. So we don't know exactly, but it's, these, it's an abnormal immune reaction um, with the interaction of the bacteria that live on your skin with this Demodex mite, which may lead to inflammation. And of course, there's a genetic predisposition. So the West of Ireland is much more commonly, patients would suffer with rosacea. And if you've got a family member with rosacea, you're more likely to develop it too. So what patients would describe is that they feel that if they're excessively hot, they would get red and flushed after a hot shower, exercise, change of temperature from one room to another. Alcohol may flare it, stress, UV radiation, so sunlight, spicy food, and even hot drinks such as tea and coffee. So even if they eliminate all of them out of their lifestyle, it doesn't mean that they won't have rosacea. So it's about control and knowing what your own triggers are, because some patients don't have the exact same uh, triggers, of course. And then the treatment, the most important is your daily UV protection with a physical or mineral zinc-based sunscreen. And my favorite is L to MD. The reason being is it's designed specifically for rosacea. And basically it has everything you need. It has your hyaluronic acid, which is for your barrier repair. It has your proper miner mineral um, based sunscreen with zinc in it, which is healing and anti-inflammatory. Um, and it has niacinamide, which is anti-redness. It's a, basically a vitamin. So this is your perfect sunscreen for rosacea or even acne prone skin. Again, we can use topical antibiotics or antiparasitic creams. We can use oral antibiotics, the tetracycline family, and we can use oral vitamin A medications for very severe or treatment resistant cases. And again, for those with ocular rosacea, I advise them to wash the eyes on a regular basis with um, a damp cotton uh, pad like you'd remove makeup with. And we can use topical antibiotics around the eyes also for this. So moving on to psoriasis, um, and really it is more than skin deep because it can have a significant impact on patients' quality of life. This is a very common chronic immune media mediated inflammatory skin condition and it affects up to two to three percent of the Irish population. So most people would know somebody with psoriasis. Again, there is a genetic predisposition, but it's not just one gene that's uh, involved. It's actually over 45 have been identified so far equal between men and women. But again, it occurs at two peaks. Now it can occur at any age, but the commonest would be before 20. And again, at 50 to 60. Uh, there are multiple different types, but the commonest that people would, um, would know would be the chronic plaque psoriasis, which is like both elbows, both knees. Um, but you can get, particularly after a sore throat as a teenager, a gut ache type of psoriasis, which is a teardrop type of psoriasis, which lots of little pink dots, scaly dots all over the skin, which can occur after a strep throat. Unfortunately, for some patients, they will develop joint disease, and it is important to pick up on it early because it can be a destructive type of joint disease. Um, most patients, as, as I say, will present with this classic plaque versus this gut ache type of psoriasis, in, often in younger patients. So it's a silvery scale on top of a pinky red plaque. Some patients will have pitting of the nails, which is like little indentation of the nail, and some patients will have a yellow discoloration or lifting of the nails. Again, it can be itchy, but certainly not as itchy as dermatitis herpetiformis and not the first thing that patients would report. And as I said, some patients can get arthritis with it. So treatments are very variable depending on if it's mild, moderate or severe. We can use topical tar preparations, topical steroids, topical vitamin Ds. Moving on from that, if a patient has a more moderate disease, we would use phototherapy, which is a form of light treatment in UVB, light treatment where you stand up in a, in a machine like this, Monday, Wednesday, Friday for roughly six to eight weeks. Then if that's not enough, we would move on to oral therapies, which are immunosuppressive therapies, and they're taken in tablet version. And then the newer biologics, which have been around for over 15 years. And thankfully for our patients, we have so many on the market now that we're very, very lucky to be able to offer patients uh, so many different treatments to bring their psoriasis under control compared to, you know, 30, 40 years ago when really all we had was, was cream and a, bit of, and a bit of light. So moving on to acne, again, it's a multifactorial disorder of the pilus sebaceous unit. A significant psychological and economic impact uh, on patients uh, suffering with it and it's characterized by first and foremost the blackhead which is called the comedone and then the inflammatory spots come second which are the red spots the papules or the yellow or white heads the pustules and unfortunately some patients have cystic or nodular disease which all of them can lead to scarring so i don't have the irish statistics but we know in the States it affects 40 to 50 million people per year at a cost of 2.3, 2.5 to 3 billion. And it affects over 85% of young people, 12 to 24 years. But unfortunately, the myth out there that you grow out of it doesn't actually hold true for everyone. And 20 to 40% of women will actually suffer into their 40s and about 4% of men, which definitely means that there's a hormonal driver for it. Again, if you get it at an early age, 
Um, some patients, often boys who get it at a younger age, younger than 16, would have much more severe disease and much more likely to scar. But if you have hormonal imbalance, such as polycystic ovarian syndrome and a link with celiac, then this can lead to, um, to acne. So again, what you see is inflammatory uh, lesions arise because you get rupture of the blackhead wall and then you get different inflammatory cells coming in to give you either the pus bump or the red spot. We all have this bacteria on our skin called Cutibacterium acnes and it's found deep within the follicle. And basically all of us have it, but the number of it present doesn't actually correlate with acne severity. So even if you have more than the average person doesn't mean that you're actually going to have bad acne. And um, so you get enzymes that are produced which contribute to the rupture of this blackhead and then that leads to the inflammatory lesions. So the treatment is, is very variable depending if you've mild disease and it's just blackheads, you can use topical retinoids, which are for anti-acne and anti-aging. You can also use azelaic acid, which is also safe in pregnancy, or you can just remove the, the, the blackheads to stop any inflammatory lesions occurring. If you're moving on to more moderate disease, you may add in oral antibiotics with your topical therapy because the topical retinoids are trying to reduce the oil production. You can also use the contraceptive pill in female patients. And moving on to the more nodular or cystic acne, we can use medications such as oral isotretinoin, which is a vitamin A drug. And interestingly, we use Dapsone for patients who cannot, for whatever reason, take isotretinoin. Um, now, it's an off-license indication, but we do use it as dermatologists. And for some patients, we have to tweak their lifestyle. Obviously, if they're abusing steroids, it can contribute to it. If they had adrenal or ovarian dysfunction, we may have to tackle the hormones. So sorry for the whistle stop tour, but I'm conscious that Sarah is, um, is going to be speaking to you now. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah and I'd be happy to take any questions at the end. That's great, Nicola. Thank you so much for that. I learned a huge amount listening to it. Um, so I'm going to press on ahead here and um, have a look because what we, we've spoken about all the different skin conditions that can turn up kind of in general, but specifically with celiac disease as well. And I know in the clinic, one of the questions I'm often asked is, can I do anything for my skin? So I'm going to quickly take you through some of the nutrients that we would really see as important there. And one of the first things to say about healthy skin is that skin is the last part of your body to get nutrition. So when you eat your food, your body prioritizes, it goes to your brain, it goes to your liver, it goes to your lungs and all the rest. And then whatever is left over, it kind of comes out to your skin. So when you're thinking about nutrition for your skin, it has to be really good. You have to be eating really well to make sure that your skin actually has a chance to get the different nutrients that it needs. So, I mean, the first thing we'd always say, certainly in the clinic, is are you definitely, definitely strictly gluten free? Because, you know, straight away, if you have gluten coming in from somewhere, you're just not going to absorb as much of your food. And of course, then you're going to miss some of the nutrients. You could be eating brilliantly otherwise, but, you know, if there's a bit of cross-contamination coming in, if you're not using your food list, and that's the big mistake I see people making because... As we know, the foods have to list the ingredients on the label, but they don't have to list the cross-contamination. And I do see people regularly eating foods that have no mention of gluten on the label, but we know um, are at risk of cross-contamination. So make sure you're using your celiac app or you're using your food list and just to really make sure. And if you're not sure and you've never seen a dietitian with your celiac disease, do go and see your registered dietitian because a strict gluten-free diet is tricky and difficult to get right. And it is worth the one hour of sitting down with somebody just to get yourself on the right path with it. So once you've, you're definitely gluten-free, what are the particular vitamins? And Nikki has mentioned vitamin A, and this is a really important vitamin for helping to hold moisture in your skin. Um, if you're low in vitamin A, you're just a little bit more likely to get dry skin. So vitamin A helps to make your skin a little bit more supple, a little more firm, and it helps to reduce, you know, if you're low in vitamin A, you're going to have that little bit less dry and flaky skin um, with that. So vitamin A turns up in red, orange and yellow coloured fruits and vegetables. So your sweet potato, your red peppers, your carrots. It's going to be in green vegetables like kale. And then you're going to pick some up in oily fish like salmon and mackerel. So you want to be getting your red, orange, yellow coloured vegetables in. You need some every day. So this is your red and yellow peppers in a stir fry, you know, your sweet potato with your dinner, carrots, all of those. But those are foods. Think about getting those in every single day um, because that is what you're going to need. Vitamin C helps to build collagen in the skin. It helps to keep nice and firm. It also helps to deal, you know, when you saw those red 
kind of inflamed rashes, vitamin C is quite good for helping the body to heal that as well. And it helps to protect a little bit against UV damage. Now it is not a substitute for sunscreen, but it is a good vitamin to have in there. And we know where to get this. This is all of our fruit and veg, especially citrus, kiwis, berries, things like strawberries and raspberries have loads of vitamin C in them. Um, peaches, peppers, any of those foods. And again, what you're thinking about is that at least a third of every meal is fruit or salad or veg. And that way you will be getting plenty of vitamin C in every day. Iodine and selenium are two really important minerals for your skin. Iodine helps to keep skin healthy. De selenium helps protect against DNA damage, which can affect the skin. And we know that if you have low levels of selenium, it changes a skin growth and its skin is slower to grow and turn over. And so it doesn't heal and repair as quickly as it should. So you're going to find iodine in foods like milk and yogurt, and you're going to find it in fish and shellfish. You will get a little bit in seaweed if you like it, if you're looking for a plant um, version of it. But otherwise, they're really the three foods, dairy foods, fish and seaweed would be the big ones for iodine. And then selenium is in, found in all kinds of fish, and it's actually in a lot of nuts and seeds, but Brazil nuts would be the famous ones um, that are very, very high in selenium as well. Zinc is another really important nutrient for skin growth, but also for strength in your skin. And it really can change pigment in your skin if it slows down. So if you're low in zinc, you know, your hair growth will slow down, your skin turnover, and you should be sort of growing new skin sort of every 28 days. And also nails will be slower as well. So zinc is found in shellfish in particular. And you'll get a bit in a lot of fish, but your shellfish are brilliant. So mussels, prawns, crabs, any of those are going to be fantastic. And then your nuts and seeds. So sunflower seeds, sesame, almonds, hazelnuts, all of those are going to be the ones to add in. So think about getting those in. I mean, the nuts and seeds, you can get them in every day. They're a fantastic food. And as we said earlier, they're going to have your selenium as well. And then your fish, certainly twice a week, try and get some fish or shellfish in um, just to balance those nutrients. Fat is another really important nutrient for skin, and it's one people don't often think of, but your skin needs fat actually for moisture, for suppleness. And if you cut out a lot of fat, you know, in the mid 90s, everyone was terrified of fat and they were all cutting out fat. People were getting really, really dry skin. So we need fat for that. And fats are also an important source of vitamin E, which is also just generally um, good for our health. So using a little bit of olive oil, rapeseed oil in the day is really good to get things like um, some of your monounsaturated fats. Nuts and seeds are really good for your omega-6s. Um, and then even primrose oil can be very useful for dry skin. It definitely helps to sort of soften up skin. And then omega-3s from fish are really good for helping to reduce inflammation and just add kind of health to your skin in general. Um, the fish, you know, if you're getting oily fish once or twice a week, that's going to be great for your omega-3s. Even primrose oil really just comes in as a supplement. Um, and then, as I said, the nuts and seeds and then some of the healthy oils as well. And all of those are just going to help keep your skin soft and elastic and just really help to the body to deal with whatever is going on with it. So in just terms of pulling all of that together, definitely make sure you're gluten free. And that is the number one thing to look at. After that, think about adding in your fish and your shellfish really twice a week with those. Your fruit and vegetables in every day. Nuts and seeds, you can definitely have those in every day as well. Plenty of water. Um, you don't need to be drowning in it, but we do need to be getting a litre and a half to two litres of fluid in every day. And if some of that at least can be water, it's really good for your skin. Some supplements, you're better to try and get your nutrition from your food, but a general multivitamin as a top up if you're having skin problems is, is something maybe to think about. Um, even primrose oil, if you have very dry skin and fish oils, if you don't eat fish. Now, if you are eating fish, you don't need to also spend money on your fish oils. Um, and what I'd say to you, as I mentioned earlier, you do make new skin. We have new skin every 28 days and we're putting that into our, into our skin every day. So as soon as you start eating, you're going to think about what you're putting into your body every day is really going to help build really nice, healthy skin for you every day. So that's everything I wanted to talk to you about today. You can follow us on Instagram at Celiac Ireland if you want to find out more information about more events that we're going to have today with the Gluten Free Living Show. And I'm going to hand you back to Jill. Um, and I think we have some questions there. Thanks a million, Sarah. And again, Nikki, thanks so much for what was really a very, very informative uh, chat uh, and uh, information session on my goodness, I didn't realise that so many things that could go wrong with my skin. I'll be certainly looking into taking care of it a bit more from now on. It's usually just splashing water on the uh, on the face in the morning to wake up and then out the door. Um, or rather, it was just up the stairs, but now it's out the door as well. So because to all of you who are listening today, we have just opened our new offices here in Clondalkin in West Dublin. And we also have as well... Um, 
a pop-up shop that's going to be available between now and the end of the year. So plenty of Christmas goodies and Christmas gifts. And if you're in the location and in the locality, please do pop in. There'll be somebody here uh, to greet you. And we'd be delighted to have people in to the office and into the pop-up shop between now and the end of the year. So getting back to today's webinar, I just want to say thank you again to our two panellists. I have a couple of questions, girls, and pretty much... Um, they are pretty much around uh, skin conditions. So first one here from Lisa, could a child diagnosed last year, age six now, start to show skin conditions or would these need to be watched for in later life? Uh, so I think, yes, but, um, and you can hear me there, sorry, celiac yeah. disease is obviously, it is more rare in children as is, is dermatitis herpetiformis. So, I mean, I wouldn't be kind of overly checking the child. I mean, obviously they'll become symptomatic as they become a teenager, they probably will get acne, but that doesn't mean it's going to be a lot worse because they have celiac disease. 85 plus percent of teenagers get acne. I mean, obviously, if a child develops the itchy bumps with the little um, vesicles on the arms, then of course you take them to the doctor, query DH, but it doesn't mean that they will develop any skin conditions. They may not have any. And if they are dry, just prevention is better than cure. Instead of using soaps and bubbles and things like that in a six-year-old in the bath, put in the sensible ones, which are the ones that are fragrance-free and, and, and bubble-free. To be honest, but like Silcox base, a tub, a 500 gram tub is four euro 20, uh, very simple to use. You can wash your face with it. You can wash it, wash in the shower, wash in the bath, and it can be used as a moisturizer. And um, that is easy to use, but probably for a child, you'd want something to dry in a little bit quicker. Um, so my favorite actually is La Roche-Posay Lipicar AP Plus Bound from La Roche, just because it's designed for sensitive skin, eczema prone skin, and, and kids like it it dries in quicker so it's not sticky great well maybe you might put that um um the la roche posay uh, product you might give us that uh, nikki in an email and what we'll do is we'll put it up <laughs> with yeah. um this presentation which will be available after um after today this, this afternoon we hopefully will have that available for people who couldn't uh, get the, to attend the full um webinar um sarah can i have a question here for you can you take a vitamin a supplement you can take a vitamin A supplement for sure, but one of the things I'd say is if you can get it from the food, you're generally better off because you'll get other nutrients in those foods at the same time. Whereas if you just take vitamin A, that's kind of all you get. So with, it, with you know, if you're eating your, your carrots and your red peppers, you'll be getting your vitamin C and other things as well. So yes, you can take the supplement, but definitely better off to go with the food for that one. And another one very quickly on supplements here as well. Do celiacs require iron supplementation generally? Oh, not generally. No, they only need it if they're actually very low in iron and usually only for about six months and then get a blood test to make sure it came up and then stop and then get another blood test in about three months to make sure it stayed up. Um, but usually once you're on the gluten free diet, no, you shouldn't need um, much. You shouldn't need an iron supplement all the time. OK, um, I have a question here from a, 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 a gentleman. Um, and obviously we get an awful lot of ladies who, who, who like to watch our webinars and participate, but it's nice to have a guy on. So hello, our anonymous attendee. Um, he has noticed that he's getting very dry skin around his nose, but also the corner of his lips. Initially, he put it down to wearing masks, but really he thinks now it's related to a celiac disease. He recently went to an audiologist who could see that he had psoriasis in his ears. He's also noticed scalp psoriasis as well. Mm -hmm. um, he hasn't had any issues until this year. He's 42 and obviously a male. Nikki, what would you recommend? So common things being common, it's probably actually psoriasis on the face. So a common place to get psoriasis is in the back of your scalp, in your ears or behind your ears, and then down the side of your nose or, you know, down here in the beard area. So there can be an overlap between what we call psoriasis and SIBO psoriasis, mm. where it's a yeast, like a dandruff, and you'll get redness and scaling down the side of the nose in the beard area, front of your chest, eyebrows, and in your scalp. So there are different treatments. Over the counter, there's very few. You can buy a 1% hydrocortisone cream over the counter, which will calm it down. And you can use Nizoral shampoo, which is an anti-yeast shampoo over the counter. So if you foam it up into your head, and then you rub the foam into the nose or the places that are affected and leave that foam on two or three times a week for about five minutes, that may be enough to bring it under control. But if it's not, that's as much as he can do over the counter. He should go to his GP just to get formally diagnosed and then be put on some prescription therapies. Okay, another one for you, Nikki. Is it common for DH to show on the face, particularly at the sides of the nose? And I can, this, is a, this is a link, I can see this now. I had a symmetrical blistering rash that kept me awake just prior to being diagnosed celiac. It was like my face is being stabbed with needles. God love you, that's terrible. Um, my doctor dismissed that it could be DH, saying it's exceptionally rare. However, it's cleared up fully since going gluten-free. 
Yeah, so I mean, you can never say never in medicine. And of course, the common place to get it is all along the backs of your elbows, your legs, the back of your neck, lower buttocks or back. But I've seen it in multiple places. So I have had patients on, have it on the face, not specifically on the nose. The, the two that come to mind, it was actually down the sides of their face, but sure, it could be anywhere. Yeah. And obviously, if you went gluten free and it settles, then the chances are there'd be very rare other blistering disorders that you would get, you know, on your face. And that could be other than if you if you had DH, so the chances are it was. Yeah. Great. Okay. All right. Sarah, back to you now. Vitamin D keeps dropping. Um, loading uh, keeps dropping. Loading on vitamin D. I think this might have been five thousand UL per week for eight weeks, maybe fifty thousand, and twenty five thousand UL for four weeks. Keeps up for about three months and drops again. Any advice? The big thing to do there, and I'm assuming you're a celiac with this, is go into your celiac dietitian and really get a thorough look and see is there gluten coming in somewhere. Make sure you're using your food list. Um, we would, there's really a couple of big food manufacturers that don't have gluten on the label, but will tell us that their products are not suitable. Um, so really, really important to use your food list for that. I would have a good look at cross-contamination um, with the celiac because it sounds like you're just not absorbing it for some reason. Mm. Um, so definitely go back and check. Um, so really maybe sit down with your dietitian, making sure you're using your food list or your food app um, just and really get some good information on cross-contamination and just see if that's the problem. I don't know if your TTGs are high as well. Um, they might be worth checking at the same time just to see if gluten is an issue with it. Okay. Um, Sarah, I just want to reiterate again, um, the, the, you mentioned the food list and the app, and I can't emphasize enough for people who are listening to this webinar today. What we do in the Celiac Society is that we actually get a binding declaration from every brand and manufacturer that is listed in our food list or listed in our app that the product is 20 parts per million of gluten or less and that they can guarantee no cross-contamination. So that is a legally binding declaration that is signed by all the brands and all the manufacturers. We are the most comprehensive list of actual gluten-free, non-cross-contamination mm -hmm. uh, uh, products in the country. The list is currently running at somewhere in the region of between eight and a half and 10,000 products. And the reason I'm saying between those numbers is because in the food list, it's a static list. It means it doesn't change, but the app is updated on pretty much a bi-weekly basis. So products are being added to the, to the, to the CSI app and the, to the, the actual dynamic tech uh, food list um, every week. So for those of you who are not members, it's free when you're a member of the society you get your food list book and you also get access to your app and you can put that app on five devices and it really is the most comprehensive list of gluten-free products in the country we also cover not only um just gluten-free foods but also like sarah and and nikki have mentioned supplements and dietetic requirements as well um so I really do recommend that if you haven't downloaded the app, I would download it today. If you're not a member, please do consider joining because you do get access to the app, um, as Sarah has mentioned before. Um, the, um, and I have another couple of questions coming in here. Can you get DH even when you're sticking to a gluten-free diet? I keep getting rash on my legs, which is matching on both legs. Seems to start like circle of blisters. Uh, yes is the answer I suppose there may be some cross-contamination that you just don't even realize and you think you're sticking to perfectly gluten-free but you might not be but of course it could be a numerous other rashes that can present that way and um, but yes you can get it even if you think you are so I mean if you if you think you have a rash that's not going away you should go to your GP and get checked and obviously if your GP doesn't know um you know whether it is or it isn't you would have to be referred on to a dermatologist to do a skin biopsy Okay, I have a couple of questions here now, girls. I just want to check for both of you. Are you all right on time? Can we go through another couple of questions? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Sarah, I had my blood test taken by my GP. My TTG was 104. I have no other okay. symptoms. My GP referred me for a scope, but does this mean I could have celiac disease? Okay, so what you, we need the scope to actually confirm it. Um, so it's, it is quite a high level, um, but we do need, because sometimes other things can cause a high TTG. So in adults, you definitely need to get your biopsy. Really important to keep eating the gluten until you have the biopsy. The big, big mistake people make is they come off the gluten and then when they have the biopsy, it'll come back negative, even when they are celiac. So stay on your gluten for that. So it's just, yes, yeah, try and get your biopsy as soon as you can um, and do that. So it'll, you'll have to unfortunately just wait that little bit longer for it. 
Yeah, the scope is the is the gold standard, and um, in particularly in adults, it's the gold standard. The scope and the blood test. And um, you mentioned as well, Sarah, the dietetic appointments. How important they are to get to see your dietitian. And um, remember, if you are referred from your GP to a HSE dietitian, it is covered on the HSE. However, if you're in a hurry or you really want to see a dietitian quite quickly. As a member of the Celiac Society, we subsidise um, the, the dietetic appointments and they are at a very reduced price at the moment. So again, something to do to think about. And it is, Sarah, that you would be seeing. Um, I have a couple of questions here. Um, what's the best thing for a 12 year old to clean their skin every day? Nikki, I think that one's for you. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it depends if they're starting to get a bit of oily prone skin, you want them to be using a gentle uh, cleanser. So it depends if they've got, if they had eczema prone skin, you might want a creamy based cleanser. And if they don't have eczema prone skin, and you think they're starting to get a bit of acne, it would be a foaming or gel based cleanser. So there are a few on the market um, and I've no affiliation with any of them is in Cetaphil, CeraVe, and also La Roche-Posay Effaclar. They would be the three that are relatively inexpensive, easy to use and come in kind of pump dispensers. So quite easy for, you know, a 12, 13 year old to use uh, on a regular basis, yeah. Staying with kids, should I moisturize my eight year old skin after every shower? I presume they mean their eight year old skin, <laughs> not their eight year old skin. Um, ideally, um, but I mean, if, if the child is not used to having it uh, done regularly, it's a bit like trying to chase them around and put sunscreen on. It's not so easy. So it is about routine. So, I mean, the sooner you can introduce children to regular use of moisturizer, the better. Uh, but also choosing the product that they like it, as I mentioned, and we'll put it in the email afterwards, is Lipicar AP Plus Bound because it dries in so quickly. The kids love it. So that's why it's my favorite. Okay, Sarah, a couple for you now. What should your iron count level be at? Mine was five-ish last year, had three infusions, now up at nine. Is this a good level for a female? Unfortunately, the person didn't say what age group she was in. So not yet. You probably want that, depending on the, on the lab, probably well into 11, 12 um, for that. So like at nine, I'd say you're still pretty tired. Um, so I'd be looking to just chase that up and follow up. And again, um, check in with your dietitian and make sure that you're gluten-free with that, but do pop in with your GP and just see, do you need to have any additional supplements or anything for that? Another one, uh, I think that for you, Sarah, as well as being celiac, I'm on warfarin, so I have to be careful what I eat. Mm -hmm. I cannot have spirulina and turmeric. What could I have to substitute these foods? To be honest, you'll get all of those nutrients in, in other places, so they're going to be absolutely fine. Um, um, I'm watching the time here, Nicola. I know you have another appointment. So I'm just going very quickly, Sarah. This is the last question. And again, people, if you would like to email us in any of your questions to info at celiac.ie with to the topic of today's talk and the subject matter, what we will do is try and get answers for you from Sarah and Nikki. So just the last one, Sarah, how prevalent is cross-contamination in general? I realise awesome. exact... <laughs> I know, I realise an exact percentage is impossible to give, but a rule of thumb. I'm guessing it's minuscule, but those who compile the info for the food list may have a different take. I can want to give a, a, a huge, huge cross-contamination is a phenomenal problem to this yeah. person who posed this question. And that is why your Celiac Society food list and your app is so vital. The amount of gluten that would fit on the tip of a pin is enough. So if someone even opens a bag of flour, the flour just drifts into the, into the area and it'll just come down everywhere. Just cross-contamination is usually the big thing. Everybody knows about the gluten-free bread, but we find, you know, it can be on your kitchen towels. It can be, you know, hanging around the counter, how you store your food. All of that is huge. And um, so it is actually, it's the bigger problem um, for, for the celiacs. So just to wrap up, um, a couple of things I want to point out. First of all, if you have questions for Nikki or for Sarah, please send your emails to info, I-N-F-O, at celiac.ie with the subject in the email is today's, the topic of today's talk, all right? I will get those, we will try and get those questions to Sarah and Nikki and try and get them answered for you by the end of the week. Now, remember, these are two very busy ladies with two very busy clinics, so we will do our best for you, okay? Um, in relation to cross-contamination, if you have any queries or questions on how to set up your kitchen, we actually offer a service here, and that is with Francis Buckley, our in-house chef and food advisor and general kitchen expert. So I would highly recommend that you book an appointment with, with Francis. She will do it over the phone, or you can actually come into our offices here in Clondalkin in Dublin 22, the, um, in the addresses on our website, and have a chat with, with Francis there. Again, Sarah is available as our dietitian on Mondays and Wednesdays. And Nikki, can I thank you 
enormously. And I know I've now left you running four minutes to get to your next appointment. I am so sorry. But we're always just about there. So it's okay. It's no very grateful for your time, your expertise and the amount of information you've given here today. I know our, our, our uh, attendees were really delighted with it. So thank you both, Sarah and Nikki. And thank you to everybody who attended uh, this, this afternoon's webinar. I hope to see you during the week for the rest of the Gluten Free Living Show uh, webinars this week. And don't forget to check out the Gluten Free Living Show um, stalls as well, which are available through glutenfreelivingshow.ie. Thank you very much, ladies. Have a great day and a great week. Thanks a million. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.